Mondays in the chat. Monday is Monday is Monday is Monday. A A. Time to get motivated. Time to get motivated. Oh, a. it's a new a. Monday. It's a new a. day. It's a new a. week. Hey, <laughs> what up, y'all? Time for a new week. Time to get motivated. Mm -hmm. Let's recap from last week. So last week, we had the lovely Ashley McCoy, who is a cancer warrior. She talked about her journey, her story, and her, her continued journey that yeah. she's currently going through. She is a rare, very, I think she's only one of two people in the world that have her uh, mutation of a lung cancer, a very rare lung cancer. Um, and she's still fighting. She has a beautiful, amazing sunshine spirit. If you met her, you would never even know um, the fight that she was going through. Her and her mom are an absolute um, pleasure to chat with. We were laughing so much. Mm -hmm. uh, we walked away feeling inspired by her journey um, and just by her outlook on life every day, despite you know what doctors had to say. Mm -hmm. um so that was definitely um if you didn't catch it live the recap is still there you can go and press the replay yeah, yeah, yeah. you'll see it on our igtv series uh money motivational chat so you'll definitely catch it there okay so before we get started yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah before we bring in our guest host this week um we want to announce we will be joining extra life um in gaming for 24 hours in an effort to raise money for our local Children's Miracle Network Hospital. So here in Philadelphia, that hospital would be CHOP. Um, part of the Children's Miracle Network Hospitals is um, their mission is to serve children no matter whether they have insurance or not, no matter their income, they never turn away a child for treatment. Exactly. Um, so we'll be streaming next, this coming Friday? Yeah, so Friday the 6th at 8 p.m. The National Game Day is... Uh, Saturday the 7th. Um, so we decided to make our start uh, Friday at 8 and then it will run until Saturday night at 8. Um, so yeah, so we'll be doing it through our uh, our youth organization, Kick the Day. Which I had the shirt on today. Mm. Okay. So um, yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, the kids are going to be involved. Um, you know, our oldest, uh, you know, definitely means a lot to him because he actually has a friend who's currently in um chop um receiving treatment um he's been in there for um a while now um mm -hmm. so it, it definitely hits home with us uh so being able to you know our we have a gamer household so just being able to play games and have fun and, and raise money you know yeah. can't ask for anything better than that for sure so without further ado we are going to introduce Cass and idris davis mm -hmm. both parents of a micro preemie they're going to share their story of becoming parents to an amazing beautiful micro preemie boy um and what life is like now 10 years later yep all right so let's bring them in Hey guys, his and her juices has joined us. If you haven't, you need to try their juice. Mm -hmm. Hey, hey, what's going hey, on? Hey, how are you guys? What's up with the what's up? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for agreeing to join us tonight for Monday Motivation Chat. The goal here is to inspire those watching and who will watch the replay later on with some motivation through your journey um, and how sharing how you guys kill the day every day as micro preemie parents. So introduce yourself, guys. Um, so hello, hello, hello. Thank you. Such a pleasure to be here. I am Cassandra. Um, I am the mother of a micro preemie, his, our little KD, um, which I'm sure you'll probably see him pop behind us at some point because he can't control uh, being <laughs> in the room and knowing what's going on. So uh, we are 10 years later. Um, yeah, that's me. My name is Idris, and I'm the dad. <laughs> <I'm> the dad. <laughs> you also be my husband. All right, guys. So let's start kind of from the beginning of the pregnancy and how that journey 
was for from both perspectives of mom experiencing the pregnancy and then also dad what your experience was like through the pregnancy um it, so it was it was really an interesting journey um we uh when we found out we were pregnant we found out that we were expecting somewhere around thanksgiving of 2010 mm-hmm. and so that's the end of november by about december 8th i was on full bed rest so it hadn't even really kicked in good. I was in, on full bed rest because I had something called hyperemesis. And hyperemesis is a um, pregnancy disease where all you do is just throw up. Just You just have morning sickness all day and it's extreme. It's very severe. I mean, to the point where we had, um, before I had even had my first visit for the doctors to really confirm, you know, that first visit you have when they confirm, Yes, you are mm-hmm. pregnant. This is how many weeks you are. We hadn't even had that visit yet. And they were talking about putting um, me in the hospital um, because I just couldn't keep any fluids down. It was just, it was worse. I wouldn't, it, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. So it was the worst thing. I couldn't keep anything down at all. No fluids. I would just throw up even stomach bile because I couldn't eat anything. Mm-hmm. And so um, at that point, they had given us, they had given us the um, choice of whether we wanted to um, stay in the hospital or have nurses and medicine delivered to the house. So at that point, we had decided that we were that enough was enough. We were in and out of the emergency room because I was so sick um, throughout mm-hmm. those first couple of weeks that um, we decided that we would stay home. And I had to have a, a emergency procedure done to have um, a pick line, um, mm-hmm. and a pick line was placed in my arm and it, it brought fluids and it kind of dropped fluids in, in through my chest. So we were, I was kind of basically bedridden by that at that point. So I walked around with the IV pole through the house with meds, but as much as I could get out the bed. So the first couple of months when we first found out we were pregnancy, what was pregnant was horrific. Mm-hmm. And as a dad, like um, when she was going through that, you know, you, you, you hear all the stories about, you know, women going through pregnancy, they have the morning sickness. Well, this morning sickness was different. Like to the point where she was throwing up and there was nothing to throw up. Mm. You know what I mean? And and her body was just constantly trying to throw up something. So me not knowing what I could do, the only thing that I could do was, you know, just be there and support her. And it it was, it was really a terrible thing. Mm. Like, cause as a as a as a man in a relationship, we there to protect and and you know, nurture and all that, and and really, that was a situation that was just totally out of my hands. It was nothing that I could do but be there and support mm-hmm. it. That was it. So, so we started with challenges. It was rough. Start just starting out the first couple of weeks was very mm-hmm. challenging. Um, so, um, so then the pregnancy goes on a couple of months. I start to get a little bit better because now I'm on this constant medicine drip, and nurses mm-hmm. come into the house checking on me um, at least twice a week and doctors calling on a regular basis. Um, so um, I would say somewhere around about our probably 19th week of pregnancy, I think it was around the 19th week of pregnancy, we were out running errands. And I was like, oh, well, we could have a doctor's appointment. It was one of our, our regular doctor's appointment. I was high risk at that point. So we were going to the doctors very often because I was very high risk. So we, um, um, like I can remember times we would go out, like I had enough strength to go out and go shop into Sam's Club. And we'd be walking around in Sam's Club. I'm like, oh my gosh, that pizza smells so good. I want it. And I would eat the pizza. But as soon as we got to the car, it's gone. I was like, well, it tasted good. I mean, <laughs> you know, so I could, we had experiences like that. I would eat as much as I could. But as soon as I ate, I knew that it was just about the taste. It wasn't about being filled because it was going to come back up. So like around about our 19th week or so, we were at a doctor's appointment. And the doctor said, um, um, yeah, so we think that you guys are in the emergency situation. You need to go right to the emergency room. And I'm like, yeah, no, we got things to do. We're out on the errands. We had things to do. We was planning our wedding mm-hmm. and everything. <laughs> we, was on our, we was actually on our way to, uh, to see another venue because the, the church that we had had overbooked. So we was like, all right, we're going to go to this doctor's appointment and then we're going to go to see the new church and we didn't make it. Yeah, that's so where we were going. We were it was all in the same <laughs> the same beeline. They were like, Nia, no, you're gonna go right to the emergency room. 
for what? You just need to go. They wouldn't tell us why. They wouldn't tell us why. They wouldn't say anything. They were just like, you just need to go to the emergency room. But just as fast as we got to the emergency room, the same people we left at the doctor's office was there in scrubs. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. oh, you can't hear that quick. You scrubbed up and ready to go. Like, what's going on? So mm -hmm. um, they were like, okay, we're just going we're just gonna observe you. So I I can remember going in. And as soon as I went in, as soon as no as soon as that we got got into the emergency room, they were giving me this long needle in my tail. Like, what is this? And so they're like, oh, so that wasn't mine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's a steroid shot. I'm like, a steroid shot? What? What? For what? What are we doing here? I've never heard about any of this in a pregnancy. Yeah. And they were like, yeah, well, just you know, just relax and. We'll be okay. I screamed a little. And so they're like, okay, just relax. You're just going to stay in the room and relax. But I didn't know they were doing a lot of monitoring. So mm -hmm. the first day, the day went, the evening went by. They said, well, we're going to, we decide we're going to keep you overnight. Okay. So that was like maybe a Thursday or Friday. So the next day comes in. Um, so we decide we're going to try and just keep you and monitor you a couple more, an, um, another day. I'm like, well, this can't go on too long because I knew we had preparation mm -hmm. to do. So mm -hmm. our invitations for our wedding had gone out. Everybody had invitations to the wedding. We needed to resend invitations. We had things we needed to do, right? So I did the sizing for the tuxes, everything. Yeah, the wedding dress purchase, ready to go. We were ready to go. So um, they said, um, yeah, well, um, we're going to keep you a couple more days. I'm like, this can't go past Sunday. We can stay, but we're not doing this past Sunday. So I need to so check out on Sunday. <laughs> yes, yeah. I have things to do on Monday. <laughs> So Sunday comes and they said, and we let them know what we were in the process of. I'm like, I, I, I'm fine. I feel fine. I'm ready to go. We've been doing this all this time. So Sunday comes and the doctor comes in and says, so this is the situation. You, we realize you only around about 19 weeks pregnant, but we've decided you have something called preeclampsia. And we've decided that we're going to keep you here in the hospital until you had a baby. Sir. That means I'm 19 months. weeks pregnant. Yeah. <laughs> what are you talking about? I'm, I'm 19 weeks pregnant. This is a 40 week process. Yeah. Right. We realized that, right? And they were like, yeah, we realized that we'll probably try and take the baby somewhere around about 36, 38 weeks. Um, but you're going to be here. And that was just all to keep us calm. I think they yeah. kind of already knew already what the knew. situation was, but mm -hmm. it was more or less how to keep you not stressed because my blood pressure was through the roof. And for they those, was afraid that she was going to stroke out. Yeah. So what it was, was it was so high when we went to the doctor. Now, they didn't tell us any of this. We kind of figured everything out afterwards. That my pressure was so high at the doctor's office and that my urine had, um, I believe it was ketones in it, which are signs yeah. of eclampsia. So they had said, um, you know what, you, um, you all need to go to the emergency room. And so what they did was over those three days, they kind of watched us to see if my blood pressure would regulate, if they can get it to regulate, gave me the different drugs needed to try and help regulate my pressure. But if it didn't regulate, they knew exactly what it was. And so um, at that point, they were like, no, we're just going to keep her. So they kept us. Um, and so that became apartment. I can't remember the room number. Yeah. We, we called we call, like, we call it like apartment 361 yeah. because my family were bringing pictures to put on the walls. We had plants in the room, in the a carpet on the floor <laughs> because we knew we were going to be there because in my mind, in both of our minds, we're going to be there for three months. So 40 weeks, we were going to be there for <laughs> until the end of July when we were supposed to have this baby. And so, and that's April. And so we're like, um, well, you know, we just going to be here. It was actually the end of March. We're going to be here till July. So we might as well make it comfortable. Mm -hmm. And um, so a couple of days, a couple of days went by and then the doctor came in and said, let's, we just want to tell you what your stats are. You want to show the stats? You want to show the stats? Okay. So, <laughs> so they, um, they came and they said that we want to share the stats with you. So, um, he came in and he said, these are your stats. You're, you're about 19 weeks pregnant. You need to make it to 23 and four. Right. 20, so you'll hear the, the, ter the terms are 23 and four. So we would say 23 weeks and four days. You need to make it to 23 weeks and four days for your baby to be viable. Prior to that, it's very unlikely that your baby would make it, right? Because there's a lot of uh, developmental things going on in the brain during that week, just that week. That 23rd week, they're, they're very crucial things that's going on in the brain and the nervous system. So they needed him to make it past that mm -hmm. to, to, to really be like, okay, he's going to be okay. He, he has some viability at right. that point, right? 
So, um, and things have changed a little bit since then. That's, that was 10 years ago, right? So things have changed a little bit. And I think that I've seen them trying to, that, that a baby has survived at 22. But I don't know what kind of condition the baby was in. But I think they may have, they may be able to save a baby at 22. But the chances of them saying, maybe the baby can survive at 22 and 22 and 6. But not too close to that. Because every day, every hour, every moment is a crucial development moment in a baby. Like you, people take it for granted that, oh, I'm pregnant, la, la, la. But every single day, every single hour, something developmentally is going on in that baby. I'm down to certain things that you probably wouldn't even consider or think of. Like there's a period when your baby is in your womb where there's a connection that happens that makes them have the ability to make good decisions like the every like down to the nittiest your the heart, smallest your thing rate, to be able to control your your brain control it, your heart rate yeah. is, is there's a certain in a, time certain in, in time. the development time yeah that yeah. that happens like people don't realize which we'll tell you a little bit further like in your body there's a baby's heart a baby there's a valve that is between the baby's lung and the baby's heart and that valve is open mm -hmm. in 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 vitro right right so the valve is open and it's just flapping around and it causes them to be able to um just the blood to continue to flow throughout their whole body because they really don't need it but at a certain at a certain point in your pregnancy that valve is supposed to close shut mm. because once you're well, once that baby is born you can't have blood flowing from your heart through your lungs they need mm -hmm. that you, you need it to close so that your lungs stay um, stay clear and, and you don't have blood and fluid in your lungs. So that valve needs to shut at a certain point in your pregnancy, closer to the end of your pregnancy. So back to the story of us being pregnant. Um, so we, um, so we, <laughs> so we are in the doctor's. He comes in the room. He says, "So here's your stats. Your stats are you uh, need to make it to 23 and four. If you make it to 23 and four, you have a." 50% chance that the baby, no, I'm sorry, a 80% chance that the baby will not make it at all. There's only a 20% chance that this baby that we that we know, a 20% chance that he will survive. It makes me emotional whenever I talk about it. There's a 20% chance that he will survive. And of that 20% chance that he will survive, um, there's a 50% chance that he will have tons of Medical, medical issues, issues tons like he may be trached for his life he may never talk he would just be a baby that's kind of like in a vegetable state like so he may kind of know who you are he may not be able there's like tracking with your eyes so if you ever see a child's eyes that kind of just keep going back and forth back and forth that's called tracking so they were like so he may not be able to ever track you he may be blind we don't know there'll be 50 percent chance that he'd have a ton of issues and then there's another 50% chance that he would be able, he would have he wouldn't have as many issues, but he um, still would have a lot of um, a lot of issues. Now of that 50% chance that he would have he would be kind of okay. There's only a 5% chance that he would be perfectly normal. Right. So, so we so well, you have you have 100%. So then you got the 20%. And of that 20%, you got it 50. broken down from 50 bad, 50 maybe, and then of that 50 maybe, a 5% that he's going to be A-OK. -okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. And we finding this out early in the morning. And like, yeah, no, yeah, early in the morning. So they were like, so you just have to be very aware of your goals. So that's your goal was to get the 23 and four to be able to hit those stats, right? And then the other, your next goal, okay, great. You make it to 23 and four, here's your next goal. Your next goal is to make it 26 weeks. At 26 weeks, he has more of a 50, 50% 50 chance of survival. You make it to 26 weeks, great. Your next goal is then going to be 32%, 30, 32 weeks. No, 28 weeks, I'm sorry, 28 weeks. At 28 weeks, we're talking maybe an 80, 20, 80% 80 chance of survival, 20% chance that um, that he would not survive, right? Then your next goal after that is 32. We're almost certain that around 32 to 36, we can take him and he'll be okay, right? Mm -hmm. But gained enough weight, he would have had enough development that we can take him and we can probably do some things and he would be okay. So when you look at our son, he's absolutely what we call a miracle baby. Like in so many ways, he's a miracle baby. So, um, 
so I'll, so, so I'll take you up. So I'm going to get real spiritually deep with you guys. So before I get spiritually deep, I'm going to let um, Dries um, share with you a little bit about um, leading up to the night and his career and where he was in the process. And then we'll take you up to the night before, um, the night before we were about to have the baby. Mm -hmm. All right. So all at this time, while all of this is going on, she's at home uh, hooked up to IVs. Right, so and she was on like a what a two three hour drip. So the drip like was all day. Yeah, but I'm saying you had like two bags, so it was like oh the medicine bag. Yeah, was here. It was the like two hour the, drip. The IV bag was all day long, and then um and I could come off once we were in further in the pregnancy. I can come off the IV bag, bag IV bag for maybe about an hour, but then I need to get back home and get back on the bag. Mm -hmm. And then the medicine drip was like every two to four hours. It was actually. Every two hours, but it was a different med that alternated. Yeah, I had to switch so, it off. so two mm -hmm. hours would go by. He would give me one med that was a like was a, maybe about uh, um, a half a liter drip, and then two more hours he would come and give me a different med, and then two more hours he would come back and give me the med from before. Mm -hmm. So this was like around the clock all day around long, the changing these meds, beeps going off all night long. So so the, all of that, right? All, all at the same time, my, my mu I, I'm a musician, so my music career was just starting to take off, right? So I have to hook her up to the machine, shoot down to the studio, play a couple records, shoot back to the crib, hook her up to the next bag, and shoot back down. So I'm running back and forth, back and forth to the studio all night, all night, all night. Or if I had to, um, if I had to fly out, I had to, we had to make sure that we had a team that would, she, that would be covered. You know what I mean? That way she would be covered while I was gone because she needed like round the clock there. She could do everything by herself at that time. So it was really, really crazy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I take them up to that, that night that they, um, the doctors came in. You know what I mean, okay. So, um, no, you missed the part where what? the night that they came in the night before that they were the night. That's before. what I'm saying. Take them to that part. I'm at the part of the part where you were going to fly out to go out. <laughs> I told you to stay. I said, okay. Let's tell that part. On. So, so the night. Of... <laughs> <laughs> tell you story. Yo, he got to party forty two shirt because today is his birthday. Something happened, Something happened. around forty two. Happy birthday to ya! Happy birthday to ya! Hey. Happy birthday, happy birthday to you. Hey. <laughs> oh, my, that's, you know what I mean? Go ahead, go ahead. Okay, now, so let me help you remember when he can. That's why we a pair, because I help him where he can, right? So the, nice. night before, um, the night before, he was supposed to fly out to go um play for, he played for a well-known artist. So he was supposed to go out and play for this artist. And um, something told him to tell her that he wasn't going to be able to make it. But he didn't know why. This was like my 23rd and third, my 23 and three night, right? So something told him to tell her, I'm so sorry. I don't mean to stick you, but something telling me that I need to stay behind tonight. So he on the daddy couch. I'm sure you are well aware with the daddy couch. In the place. hospital, that, that piece the of daddy wood. The daddy chair. That piece of wood with that thin <laughs> layer of, cot, uh, of of cushion on the top. Yeah, it's, that. Not, it's not even a cot. It's a daddy, it's a daddy chair, right? You see the daddy chair. And so the, here, here is my little, I'm taking you a little bit spiritual that I don't really talk to a whole lot of people about, but um, it's in a book. Um, it's in a book that we have coming out really soon. Um, there's an excerpt of the, a chapter of the book coming out next month that you all be able to get the book, Women Under Fire. I'm a co-author in this book called Women Under Fire. So in the book, I talk about um, this, the night before I'm in the bed. And um, we're believers. Um, we, we, you know, we know that God takes us through everything. So I'm laying in the bed and we're sleeping. It's about three o'clock in the morning. And I believe during that time, without a shadow of a doubt, that I encountered God that night, right? Not knowing what's going to happen the next day. I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that I encountered God that night. So I was sleeping in my bed. They had monitors all over my stomach because um, RKD was super active this night for some reason. And they were like, we're gonna, he's real active. So we're going to just monitor you up because we're not quite sure why he flipping and dipping and kicking and oh, he was just moving all night long. So at some point I had said to myself, like, I need you to calm down because I need to rest. And I had no idea why he was so active. So I had to say, I had AirPods at that time. And at this time, I think I had an iPod <laughs> taking it back a little bit. Right. So I had put one of the headphones in my ear and one of the headphones on my stomach and um, I fell asleep. 
So, um, and I felt like at some point in the night, I felt like I heard someone come in the room and it was, I can remember the voice of God saying, um, there was this song playing on the um, iPod and the song was, um, um, the song was, I give myself away. And so there's a, it's by William, Mc, William McDowell, I believe that's who it's by. And the song talks about giving yourself away. And oftentimes Christians are like, oh God, you can use me, use me. I want to be used. We talk about that, whether you're a Christian or not, you want to be, and you want to volunteer, you want to give. And then I remember God saying that so many people want to be used, but they don't want the sacrifice. They don't want the, the, the they don't want the sacrifice that comes with being used. They want the limelight of what it comes what comes from being used, but they don't want the sacrifice. They don't want the pain that may go that you may have to go through to get to something to have a testimony. You just want the hey, I went through this. You don't really want to go through that. So you ask me to use you, but you don't really want to me to use you because you don't really want the pain that goes with it. And so then I'm laying in the bed and I'm like, well, God, I, I'm here. Use me. So then I remember falling back asleep. And I remember waking back up again, and the song that was on the on the um, iPod was "I Give Myself Away." Um, you know, the, I'm sorry. The song was "You Will Live and Not Die," and it's by Israel Newbury. And the song talks about you will live and not die, um, and it talks about your testimony and all that we give you will keep you alive. So I'm like, oh. Then I remember distinctly hearing the voice of God coming and saying, "What you're about to go through is going to rock you to your socks." but I promise you that you and your son will live and not die. Mm. Okay. All right, God. So then I remember falling back asleep. And then I remember waking back up again. And I remember the song being on the iPod was, um, these are the three songs I distinctly remember from that night. The song on the iPod was a song by William McDowell again, Go Forth. All right, God, I'm really tired right now. <clears throat> Let's just go. So not knowing what that meant, I just knew that it was a spiritual encounter that I knew that I had was having from God. Fell back asleep. Finally, six o'clock in the morning, after I've been <laughs> up all night talking to God, knock, 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 knock. We hear somebody knocking at the door. I'm like, what is going on? So the doctor comes in the room and the doctor says, wakes Reese and I up and says, um, how you doing, Miss, Miss, how you doing, Cass? And then I said, um, I was doing great. I feel like I could run a mile. Like I'm feeling good. He said, great, I'm, I'm glad that you feel well, but here's the stats. Right now, if we don't deliver your baby in the next two hours, we're now at 23 and four, right? If we don't deliver this baby in the next two hours, you and your son will die. So what would you like to do? 23 and four was your goal. You made it 23 and four. If 28 is, you, we've already given you all the stats. They go over the stats again. So we're like, so we're at that, we're at that, 80, 20, 55, right? We're at that decision point. So do we think that he's going to make it? Do we think he's not? So I said, this is what's going to happen right now. I'm going to get in the shower. My husband's right here. I said, I'm going to go to the bathroom. My husband's right here. He can make the decision. I, I don't even know what to do. Because I all I hear is that in two hours, I'm going to be dead. So I'm like, well, my husband's here. You decide. So I went to the bathroom. I came back. I looked at him. He looked at the doctor. And he was... And he said, <laughs> "Well, the whole thing was, <clears throat> I was faced with that that uh, that riddle. You ever hear that riddle? Would be like, yo, if you was uh, if you were stranded in the ocean and you had to save your wife and your child, who would you save? You ever heard that? Mm -hmm. I was faced with that because they gave me an ultimatum. I, I had to make a decision. We could either save both of them, or we can save her." and let him pass comf comfortably. That's no, they, what, they didn't give us that stat yet. Yes, they did. Oh, I thought that was after they no, asked you if we no, were ready. Trust me, no, oh, okay. because I had, to, I had to do that and they gave me a little bit to make that decision because that's what they came to me with. I had to make a decision to, to let him pass comfortably and just save her or save the both of them. And they was like, we're gonna give you a time to make this decision because we can't go backwards. You can't say, all right, we, I'm going to um, save um, her, and then you want us to go, and then you change your mind and want to save him as well. We can't do that because they have to have certain things in place in order to make sure that everything was going to, you know, work right for the best of both of them. So I went out to my um, car, <clears throat> and I called my mom. Um, I called my dad, and it was such a blessing that I, I you know, I could do that. 
But at that point, I realized that I was an adult and I was out here on my own because they both told me, baby, I don't know what to tell you. Mm. I don't know what to tell you. You know what I mean? To have your dad tell you like, I don't know, bro. I don't know. I don't like your parents don't even know what to do. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I had to really make a decision to who was I going to save? And I had to, whatever decision I made, I had to be able to live with that and knowing that at six o'clock in the morning, six 30 in the morning. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So needless to say, I told, I went back and I said, you're going to save both of them. I want to save mm -hmm. both of them. I'm not gonna make a choice like that. Mm -hmm. What was the risk involved with, with, with when you decide it's gonna be both of them? Was there a risk associated with that where that just wasn't the the immediate? Of course, like let's say both of them. Of course, that's gonna be the answer. Because so for some people, it's not the answer. Because it's remember not. our remember our issues. So <laughs> it's like okay, let's go ahead and go through this pregnancy. Let's move very quickly and get this done. Because the thing is that we could say. 23 and 4, we had that 80, 20, 55 percentage. And everybody wants the five, right? Everybody's like, no, y'all want the five. But you don't know what you're going to get. You may get, you. we may get the 50 and he may not make it. Or we may get the 50, he makes it. And then we have time. Our life has changed because medically, I couldn't deal with the child. I'm not saying I couldn't. People think that medically, I can't deal with a child with that many issues. Like, it would change my life. Even though it's my child, I, I, I don't want that for my life, right? So that's some people think that way. And mm -hmm. and so they have to put the facts on the table. And so, and it was so, so funny because the, 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 the couple of days prior to that, everybody came up to the hospital and it was just like, oh, my sister-in-laws, they all are here. My mother-in-law, she was here. My other mother-in-law, she was here. My girlfriends from Jersey came. I'm like, why are all these people coming this week? I've been in this hospital for almost three weeks. Everybody, I think you even came. Mm -hmm. I think everybody came up like like a couple days right before. I'm like within a two-day period of me me having to make the decision because at this point everybody thinking I'm going to be there for 40 weeks. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so the reason why is because uh, because of that, and then because he was so. So here's the rocker for us, right? Which we didn't realize till later. Medically, you have to be very careful. You've got to really, you've got to be spiritually connected. You've got to know that the decisions that you make in your life are spiritually led by God. And you cannot allow statistics. You cannot allow agendas to sway what your decision is. Whatever right, in and life. There's so many different things what, yeah. in those hospitals, man. You don't, listen to me, don't just, if you're going to do something like medically, don't just take that doctor's word for it. Medically, in any scenario, <laughs> don't take people's word for it. You do your research, you do get connected research. to God, and you know what you're supposed to do. Because there's a call on every single person on this earth's life. And if you're not connected to your calling, and you don't know what you're supposed to do, and you just go off by statistics, and you go off by what people say, listen, you may be making the wrong decisions based on what someone else is Somebody telling you else. to do. Yeah. And the reason why I'm saying to that, because we realized today, there are agendas. So our baby, they so they were saying, so what do you want? It's okay, okay, we're gonna go full through, full throttle. We're gonna go ahead and have this baby. Cause some people will say, no, we're gonna try and push it. We're gonna push it to 26 weeks because our viability is a little bit stronger. I know she could die, she couldn't die, but let's try and push it, let's push it. That wasn't an option for, for us. We're gonna take this 23 and four and we're gonna go from there. Sure. And so the reason why I say, trust God because you never know the hidden agenda is because what we didn't know until later on is that um, they said you have three options. You can go, we can, once we had this baby, we can go full out, do, pull, all the, pull everything out and make sure we say this baby, give him the best chance he has. Or we can just make him put, give him a little bit of support, see what happens. Or we could just let him just pass comfortably once we have him. Because when I tell you why he was no bigger than our hand at that point, we weren't talking no baby you rocking. You weren't rocking him in your arms when we had him. You were rocking him in your hand like this, right? And so if I get a second to step away, I'm going to go show you the size of his pampers when he was born because I have him all upstairs, right? Um, so people, you're faced with that decision. And what we didn't know is that they call our baby a million-dollar baby, right? So it cost a million dollars to save our baby's life. 1.2 actually. Yeah, 1.2 million dollars. So when we when once we got home and we saw the medical bills, 
we had heard someone say that one during the time that we were in the NICU. Look, here goes a one point two. They call him one million. He goes yeah, a one millionaire. He goes yeah. another one millionaire. Yeah. But we didn't really understand what that meant until we were home from the hospital. Sorry if that's a spoiler, y'all. But um, we were home from the hospital and we saw the bills come in from um, from Blue Cross. And so we're going through the bills, looking at them. And at the bottom of one of the bills, we saw the total was $1.2 million Million. is what they spent to save our baby's life. So yeah, they give you those stats up front because they don't want, they, who wants to pay $1.2 million? Like they don't really want that. If every baby was a 1.2 millionaire, our healthcare system would be shot. We had babies like popcorn, right? As, as humans, they don't want that. So that's why they say, here's your stats. They're not going to push the agenda, but he's a $1.2 million baby. Easy. Easy. <laughs> Easy. Easy. Wow. Look, we still talking. We ain't even get to the NICU part of this, right? We still talking about just, just getting to the point, because at that point, our, our preeclampsia, so there's phases to preeclampsia. Preeclampsia has um, this, it's preeclampsia, then it's eclampsia, then it's hoax. So we had already passed, we were past preeclampsia, we was past eclampsia. Now the fact that this is fatal is where it helps. So now we now have something called, preeclampsia has moved into what we call help syndrome. We're now in the help syndrome, that we need help now because we, we're not sure. All her organs are shutting down. We need help now. We need to do help I, now. I had to make a decision because mm-hmm. she was literally dying. She had she had a couple more hours to live. We had to make a decision. Mm-hmm. Had, the baby had to come out, mm-hmm. period. That's the only way you stop preeclampsia. Just That's the only the way baby. you stop. So I had hyperemesis and I had preeclampsia, eclampsia helps. The only way you can stop that, there's no other cure to neither one of those pregnancy diseases but delivery. Deliver the baby. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the crazy part with all of those symptoms she was going through, once she had the baby, I was like disappeared. butter. I was ready to go. Disappeared. She was, she was literally throwing up on the delivery table. I had the bowl in my hand while she was like sideways while they, because they, they had to do a C section. She was throwing up. I'm holding the bowl. They doing the C section all at the same time. Mm-hmm. It was crazy. <laughs> it was crazy. As soon as they took the baby out, I was fine. She was crazy. Never threw up again. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Crazy. So here we are. It's so it's so many so much. So here, there's so many connections that happen during that process. We get they prepping us for. I'm watching the time, and I'm so sorry we even get to the the preemie part of it, like the the other part of the dicky part. But um, we're in the hospital, and they're prepping me to go to the operation room. And a nurse comes in, one of the prep nurses that comes in, and she's like, "Dries," I'm like, "What the world?" <laughs> <laughs> and so you can tell who she was. So. Come to find out, God was all a part of this, right? So wait, while he tells this part, I'm gonna go get his pampers stuff, for right? you guys, okay? So this is this is the crazy part, right? So we finds out that the doctor that delivered Kenny was actually a foster child. Not the doctor, the nurse. No, the actual doctor. The doctor that delivered it was an actual foster child of my grandma's. Oh wow. Right, yeah. oh. the anesthesiologist was a base is a bass player, who who knew about me, right? So he told everybody. He come to find out, he was like the head anesthesiologist in the area. He he found out what we was going through because he's a friend of the family. He told them though, he would be right there. He came from uh, University of Penn down to Abington Hospital with his with the team and everything. He ran the whole anesthesiologist part of it. So I had I had that co- that coverage. So we had a person who was looking out for us doing the anesthesiologist and somebody who was looking out for us doing the delivery. That's insane. That's that crazy. Crazy. <laughs> that crazy. That's crazy. And I didn't find out that the, uh, the, who the doctor was until after Kenny was born. We walking through the hallway and the doctor recognized my dad. And that's how we found out that they was like, yo, what you doing? I just, didn't... oh, that was my grandson. Like, yo, it was crazy. Had no clue. That speaks to how <laughs> generations after you will reap 
what you sow, right? Exactly. Your grandchildren and your great grandchildren will reap by what you sow into other people, what you sow into the world. Like that's crazy. That's I crazy. Didn't he knew me from playing bass. And his wife, his wife also was. Um, she uh, her her kid his her his kids went to my sister for tutoring on a regular basis. So um, when that all went down, we I had called Charlene and she was like, "Oh, I'm calling Dr. Levet." So he kind of knew the whole scenario. The whole scenario. Mm -hmm. And he's like the top guy in the in the area. So we had the best of the best. You know what I mean, when we need him, when we made that decision, God was already working stuff out. Man, it was crazy. Wow. Wow. All right, let's see. Oh, okay. Let's see what we have here. So like so like these micro peonies are born very, very small. I don't know if you guys can see. Um, let me see if you can see. Can you see those the, those fingerprints there? Yes. Mm -hmm. Can you see it? Yes. Those are, those are actual hands. Those are just actual fingerprints. Like that was how my finger. That's how big his hand was. Wow. That's his actual when they do the, the prints. And so then here are his feet. So you can see like relative to how big they were. Those are his little feet. So wow. this is him, if you can see in the NICU. Can you see it? Is it clear? Yep. Yep. So that's him holding my hand, if you can see him holding our hand. That's mm -hmm. how teeny he was. Mm -hmm. He didn't have any skin. Um, his eyes were still fused together. His ears, his ears didn't were have still, any cartilage. They were still, still stuck to his, his face. Eyes, yeah, to his head. <laughs> he was not a baby like you would, you know, you're used to seeing. He was really like still cooking. Still cooking. So this was his first hat that was too big. Too big. Like he had to get clothes from like uh what's that builder bear? Well that was when he was that was when we took him home. Yeah. But prior to that he didn't have any clothes. And so then his first pamper was is the size of a um this is his first little pamper. So So to put in perspective, if you guys buy the trident <laughs> gum packs, that's about exactly the, the size, size of a four big gum. Yeah, hold on. Yes. The size of four box um, yes. gum packs. That's about the size of that diaper. So look, he's got he's got a relation for you. So this is like a, some, a seasoning bottle. Some seasoning. <laughs> oh, it's wow. smaller than the bottle. Smaller mm -hmm. than the bottle. And they were too big for him. They were falling yeah. off of him. This, so that was his first pacifier. But that took forever for him to be able to suck on that. Wow. The, yeah, so let's see what else do we have in here. So you essentially saw him evolving outside of the wound, like mm -hmm. literally happening in the wound, like developing your last layer of skin, the ears oh. coming to form, the eyes opening. What's that? that? Was a cuff. The blood to go around your arm and do your blood pressure. pressure. That was a, your blood pressure cuff, yeah. That's how small it is. And that was too big. They had to wrap it twice like that to get it around his arm to, his to be able to pressure. take his blood pressure to go around his arm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, man. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> so we were there for 100, 100 102 and, days. 102 days. Um, see if and I he had to get, to in order to bring those micro preemies and preemies home, they have to reach a certain weight. You know what I mean? He has to weigh a certain amount or they don't they don't let him come home. He has to be able to eat, um, keep food down. What was it like five ounces? Um yeah, yeah, five ounces. So and so different when you have a so when you talk to a um a micro preemie parent and their baby's <laughs> in the NICU, we all you will hear somebody say, Oh my gosh, my baby drank one cc of milk a day. And we like, Yeah, 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 because like one cc of milk is is dinner for a week for you guys for us right like it's like what one cc of milk or what he did one ml like yes yes because those are huge milestones that if you can do a drip inside of a micro mouth and they they hold it they, they keep, keep it, it, it 
Woo, they got nourishment. They got nourishment to keep them building, to keep them going. Wow. So you'll see micro wow. premium. Have we had those rejoicing moments? Whenever I see a micro premium mom now, whose baby's in a NICU, and they're like, oh my gosh, my baby drank a, just like a spoonful of milk today. Like my heart gets excited because I understand what that means and, mm. and, and what that means to the, the opportunities, how, how much closer you are to bringing that baby home, mm, yeah. right? That's all you really want to do is bring your baby home. And so for me, I, I, they were like, you need to go home. And I'm like, no, nah, I'll go home, take a nap and come back. But for the most part, I knew that I was here to help breathe life into this child. So we would do things to encourage parents um, um, to, um, after a while, once we got our rhythm and we felt, we, we, we found some, some amazing friendships out of the NICU. People we're close to today, like mm -hmm. there's probably not many babies that can say, um, I have a, one of my closest friends is a, is a parent that we met in the NICU or in the nursing ward. Like, Kenny, you want to claim these closest friends? He, they're, they were isolate buddies. They were next to each other in the isolate. So um, they, their isolates were like, like right behind each other. So, um, so you'll find that that experience is an experience. It's a world by itself. And there's so much understanding and there's so much, um, there's so there's such a union in that circle when you are a NICU parent that we understand language and we understand things that you go through because if you've ever gone through the NICU, um, and Juju, I don't know whether you were able to come up to the hospital to see him when he was in the NICU, right? I thought that you did come. Yeah. Um, that going through the NICU is a whole nother world. You're like, oh, wow, yeah. wow, <laughs> this is something yeah. else. Um, because you, you're seeing babies come and go, and we don't mean go home we mean just literally babies don't make it so today i come in charlie's there and tomorrow i leave and charlie's gone i'm like where's charlie cast where's charlie cast you can't ask about charlie i'm asking where's charlie i've been watching charlie for the last five days now where's charlie so here's our little micro preemie come stand right here come, here. come on hey kd say hi this is the little guy that was. This is him. That's him. <laughs> so then we, you know, we just want to, we do want to encourage other people that may be going through this. It's it's a lot of hard work. Um, but if the thing is, I think what really um, helped him was that we loved on him mm -hmm. every day. You have with these kids. They're different than a regular baby. You have to love on them. You have to hold them. You have to have them close to your body, do something called kangaroo care. All of those things, that helps their Which development. Skin to skin. Skin to skin. They get, mm -hmm. they get different um, enzymes and different things off of the parent's body. M Mama and dad alike. Mama and dad. dad alike, right? You know what I mean? Skin mm -hmm. to skin. Some people, some, um, some countries, they actually have the parent take off for a year just so they can give kangaroo care. In that, in that situation with the babies because yeah. um, and a lot of times we would, we would come in or I would come in and his numbers would be off the chart. Like I would get there in the morning they're like, he's having a rough day. Okay, what are you trying to tell me? Mm -hmm. We don't think it's a good day that you hold him. I don't really care what you think. That's my child and I'm going to hold him. But we don't right. think it's a good idea. But when, as soon as he got on my chest the numbers and we began to snuggle, his numbers came down, like he knew what presence he was in. So there's a, there is a distinct difference when your baby's in the isolate. When a hand goes in that isolate, that baby, they that, know they know they why know you're when coming it's a nurse in. Because they know it's a nurse, because nurses come in there and they picking and poking and all that. So you can actually, they know their, their whereabouts and who's around. And when we're there, holding our hands like this at, at his head and his feet, his numbers, his ox, his post ox, everything just go right where it needs to be. Mm -hmm. It's very important that you uh, that you support that child. We've seen other children in there who have passed away simply because nobody came to visit them. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Parents would never come, and I'm like, does he have? Even does he? Can I hold him? No, Cass. You can't touch the baby. But he just needs somebody to comfort him, just to say I love you. Like someone mm -hmm. needs to say something. So and we will come in the next day, and the the, the ice will be empty, and we just like, know what what where, happened. Where where is he? Right. Where is where is she? Where is she go? Where yeah. you know? So we just encourage if there are micro premium moms out there, can you go get your blue blanket off your bed with the guitars on it, please? If um. 
if there are micro preemie moms and dads out there. So we're not telling you don't listen to the doctor, but we're telling you to advocate, advocate for, for your kid. child. That's yeah. your child. God gave My that child friend. to you. Advocate for your child during this time. And then if you have an opportunity to find a way to give back, give back as much as you can. So one of the things that we do, and we typically do, there's an organization called March of Dimes. And so that's probably the number one March of, that's the number one um, preemie organization to support the development of young babies. So we often do things for, we haven't over in last April because of COVID. We usually march for them. We usually raise money for them. But Kenny even takes it a step further. And usually he didn't do it last April is Kenny will go out and speak to other kids and other organizations about what, um, about being a preemie. So I don't know that Kenny remembers being a preemie, but we talk to him, but we make him very secure about what his beginning was like in life because it's important. I think that um, I'm also working with a group right now where we're building legacy books. And so if something were to happen to me and um, I, or I don't have a voice to tell him about what happens, we, we, we need to produce a legacy book. And, and I'm working on now just gathering as many facts as I can and putting it in a format where I can give him a legacy and I can say, here's your legacy. Here are the things that you need to remember. This blanket that you have right now was a blanket what, that covered your isolate. So if we pass on and we don't leave information for our kids about who your grandmother was or who your grandfather was, <laughs> or this is something that I cherish, they don't have those memories. So we keep all this stuff because, we, uh, because I'm building a legacy box for Kenny so he knows about his life. In the event I or his dad can't tell him his story, he has somewhere to go where he can read about his story and know about his story. So that's what I want to encourage all parents, whether you're a preemie parent or not. If you are a parent or if you're just here, create a legacy for your child. So one of the things that Kenny does is he, um, in April, he goes out and he speaks to different kids and he speaks to different um, um, organizations about 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 supporting Marsha Dines and supporting um, micro preemies. And so he has a little organization that he started called Knots of Love. And so Knots of Love is we make blankets like this that cover the isolates because when you think about it, when a baby is in an isolate, the goal of the isolate is to mimic the mother's womb, right? So it needs to be as dark and warm as possible. That's why inside those isolates, it's always very, very warm and it needs to be dark. So a lot of, you'll find that a lot of um, isolates use blankets, a lot of hospitals use blankets to cover the isolate so that it stays nice. So he, he has an organization called Knots of Love. And so when he's in school during the month of April, he will have all his friends just sit and tie. If you look at the blanket, at the end of the blanket, it looks like his fringes. Um, and each fringe has a little knot tied of it. And so mm -hmm. this is, a, he, he, they, the kids tie the knots as this is our knot of love. This is our binding of love that we love you. So he does this thing called knots of love in April. And he makes, we make as many blankets as we can for, um, for the, for different hospitals that have NICU centers within our, within our area. So um, I say that to say, if you are, a, if you are a surviving NICU mom and dad, find a way that you can give back, whether it's giving to an organization or whether it's just marching with March of Dimes and raising money. Because it, again, there's so many um, babies in NICUs and it's so expensive um, to go through a NICU and parents sometimes just need support. Yes. Um, and if you know somebody that's going through the experience and their babies in a NICU, you can't, typically you can't, we were blessed that we were able to swindle all of our family into the uh, NICU to see <laughs> Kenny because typically the rules are mom, dad, grandparents, period. That's it. That's yeah. it. So we were able to get more people to come in. Uh, quite a few people came in to see Kenny because he's special, right? Mm -hmm. So um, we just um, encourage you, if you can't go in and see the baby and support the baby or just you want to go up to the hospital, you know what helps? Go do their laundry. Go make them dinner go wash dishes like do some of the things because caring for a child in the NICU and coming home after being in the NICU all day caring for your child and then having to come home for the mom for the dad it's a lot of pressure but for the mom you gotta pump all day long so imagine having to go home to a dark room with no baby and pump so part of pumping because the baby needs the mom's milk 
Yeah. That's what's going to help them survive. Yeah. They can get milk from a milk bank, and they will give them milk that is. Um, I'm sorry about the time, you guys. There's so much to share. Um, so they can give the babies um, milk that is a, a, a formula type milk, but the best milk for a baby that's in a NICU is the mom's milk. So you have to go home and you need to pump, 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 pump on a master pump because pumping out milk is all about emotions and eating right. You under a lot of stress. So you go home to a dark room and you already depressed and crying and sad because maybe you got a phone, bad phone call in the morning time. It's harder to pump, right? So go feed that, go make dinner, go help that mom or dad, however, go take care of some of the kids that they may already have home. Because I can't imagine having a kid in the NICU and have two, three kids at home too. So if you're looking for something that you can do to help a mom in the NICU, send a bill. Mm -hmm. Go do laundry. As far as the brothers, the men, the only thing you can really do is just support the mom and the child. That's really the only thing that you can do. Be there. Whatever they, whatever needs to be done, do it because it's they're going through so much emotional stuff. They need your they need you to step up and, and it's just take it on your shoulders and, and it just be there. Be that rock for them. Because that's really that only thing that a man can do. You know what I mean? Outside if they're not the doctor and all that kind of stuff. The only thing we can do is just be extremely supportive. That's the only thing. So I would encourage the men to um, just be there for your woman and be there for your child. And take time for yourself mentally. Very important for the men to be able to step off, get your mind right, do what you got to do, and come back because it's very taxing mentally. You know what I mean? So be there for your family. But also, you have to make time for yourself mm -hmm. to, to yeah. decompress. You know what I mean? And then also for the women, in that same note, the same thing. You take those five days, take those moments. Because what I realized <clears throat> months into being in the NICU, um, he was there April. I think we brought him home in September. Somewhere around September, we were able to bring him home. But what I realized somewhere around July is that I have the best babysitters right, right now, the best babysitters in the world who are going to feed, who going to, they're going to do everything that my baby needs to, needs done to them. I have the best babysitters. So it's okay for me to walk away and take care of myself for a second um, because my baby is in good, is in good, prayerfully in good care, right? Mm -hmm. So just remember that you can just, as a mom, you need to take care of yourself as well to try and do whatever you need to do to try and eliminate the stress and to try and really live in the moment. Um, and then if I could just really quickly take you to 10 years later, because once you're home from the NICU, um, that's when life begins differently, right? So once we came home, yes, they were like, yay, you're graduating, you're done, you're going home. So now we're home. So now we're home. That's when life begins on a whole nother note. Because we came home with our baby on oxygen, oxygen. on every kind of monitor Seat you can pack. imagine. Yeah. So he so he's he's getting oxygen through his nose, um, through what we call a C well, uh, so it's a nasal cannula. He's on monitors for his heart, he's on monitors for his breathing, he's on a pulse sock, he's on all this. So we got this teeny weeny itsy bitsy baby that's about five pounds in this small all these, all these machines next to us. So you're not going to get no sleep because it's beeping all night long, right? So, um, but what I want to encourage you is that life, like, continue to enjoy and embrace the process. And maybe your process, and so hopefully this will speak to somebody, whether it's about a baby or whether it's not about a baby, maybe it's just something that you want in life or something you want to pursue in life, enjoy the process because there's a process that is ordained for your life that's not ordained for someone else's life and maybe your desired end result is i want to have the biggest gym on earth or your path to getting to that gym may not be planet fitness path to get into that gym enjoy your enjoy your journey so maybe i want to have the healthiest baby in the world my path to having a healthy child is not going to be your path so don't compare yourself to other people enjoy your journey enjoy your journey because our journey like it's such a, such a blessing that we're having this call today because Kenny got we had to uh, we had to switch him from one school because, as a result of COVID to a virtual school and we were really nervous about that whole process because he had gotten to an environment that was small cozy who catered to him and this is a different environment but today we got his first 
um, letter, a letter from his principal that said, congratulations, you made honor roll. So for us to be able to have this micro premium, so first of all, let's be clear, Kenny has always been on honor roll, right? Since he's, since it's for his whole educational career, but he's always also been in the same school. So to see him switch to another school and still be able to maintain and to manage in an environment where nobody's like, oh, Kenny, oh, Kenny, because everybody at his old school knew his story. They knew who he was. So they tend to kind of lean towards that, uh, this is our baby Kenny, and we appreciate that, but he still is able to hold his own. So you may have some struggles in learning development, and that's okay. That's okay. So embrace that. that. That's his journey. And, and guess what? Yeah, and, and there's help for that. And guess what? When he's 42 years old, nobody's going to say, hey, when you were in the fourth grade, you couldn't you couldn't decipher between A-R-E and and. and, and I ask when to use that in the sentence. They're not going to say that to him. That's his journey right now. So embrace your child's journey and let them grow up to be who they need to be. Right. So, and that goes for anyone. If you have a goal in life, embrace the journey. There's another book that we're working on called Start to Done. And when I talk about two, it's the process in between. So raising a, a, a micro preemie child, there's a process. Raising any child, there's a process, right? But right, when they right. touch the has some developmental issues, embrace it. Embrace it. Love it. That doesn't make them different. That gives they them their own path. They, they have, have a different, different way of, of doing things. That's and it's it. okay. It's okay. I work yeah. in a school for, I work in a school with kids who have behavioral issues and special needs. And what we've learned in that environment is that these kids aren't bad. They've got their own way of doing things. So let's embrace the way of doing things and cult and, and cultivate that energy to be able to say, hmm, yeah, yeah, he may scream when he's not getting his way, but that's the way he lets out his frustration. So let's cultivate that and let's show him how to use that. So again, that too, that process, embrace your journey. And if your child is different, they're doing things differently as a result of their start, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Mm -hmm. We love you guys so, so much. much. There's you. there's more questions, but I think that we're gonna we're gonna leave those questions for like maybe a, a couples or marriage four one one situation. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But before IG cuts us off and doesn't let us um, properly wrap this all up, uh, for the both of you separately, um, through the obstacles, how do you kill the day? You want to go first? Um, basically, I kill the day by staying focused on the goal. I set a goal, and I, I, I attack each piece of that to get to the goal is see the thing about a goal is it, that's the end result but there's also little steps along the way so i focus on those i focus on the goal and then i focus on the little individual steps each day to get to it that's how i do it so for me i have decided that in my life i am not i can't be the expert of all things right so i don't try and kill the day by myself so I've learned that I need to section my life out in every area of my life that I need to kill the day. I need a mentor or I need somebody to hold me accountable. In terms of weight and fitness, I use kill the day, right? Because I know that I can't do it by myself. I've struggled and I can't. In terms of spiritual growth and spiritual process, it's too much on my plate to be able to manage it all. I sit and talk to my girlfriends. We have prayer in the morning. We work together. In terms of business, I have my business girlfriends. I have one of my good girlfriends, Serena. We talk about business all day long. We're good, close girlfriends, but she holds me accountable to reaching my goals. In terms of learning who I am, I have a coach to help me learn who I am. In terms of life skills, I have a coach for life skills. So I realized that going about it by myself it don't work for me because it's too much for me to manage. So I kill a day by allowing people to partner with me in my life to help me to kill the day. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys. So, so, so I much. thank you for helping me always kill the day. I, I welcome my little, my morning messages that say, <laughs> did you work those bodies today? <laughs> I appreciate that. And, and, and she complains about her stomach muscles a lot. <laughs> <laughs> we got to put in that work. Yes, <laughs> yes. You know how to do it better than I do. So listen, <laughs> I'm gonna rely on your expertise. You, I kill a day because you kill a day. <laughs> it's all about the team, right? Yes, yes absolutely. Yes, all day, <laughs> all day. So we love you guys so much. We love you too. We, we love, love you. you. So where's that? Where's that Munchkin at? He up, in this, he up in this room. Come here. Say 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 bye to the people. Hurry up. 
IG got us on a time limit. Hurry up, hurry, 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 hurry up. up. Say goodbye. <laughs> it's, 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 that's all you gonna get. All right, remember, always kill the day every, every day. day. Yes, every day, day. Every day. Every day. I believe. <laughs>